Today are a huge range of people, colleagues from the University of Canterbury, colleagues from the business community in Canterbury, as well as those from outside the city. What I thought I might do in the brief time that I've got is not so much rehearse what happened at our particular institution, because the reality is many of you don't run universities and sometimes are quite bemused by what such a job might entail. That may be a topic for another conversation. In my past, I've been involved in small and larger sized businesses, so for those of you in the business community, uh, there have been some extraordinary business-like challenges. Keeping customers, really important. Keeping staff, equally important. Finding the cash, because if the cash runs out, no matter how friendly you want to be, it's pretty tough. And then, while dealing with response, recovery, and renewal, and aren't we over those R words, um, one has to look forward for the big strategy, the bold initiatives, the missed opportunities, the reinvention, the reimagining, and all the other things that exhaust us. So what I thought I might do is just take a bit of an opportunity to tick off a couple of things. The University of Canterbury has for quite some time been an important part of this Christchurch community. Established in 1873, we're a $300 million a year business. We have about 15,000 students, and while we have about 2,000 full-time equivalent staff, we actually pay 5,000 people each year. We occupy an 87 hectare campus, we have 240 buildings, and 260,000 square meters of built structure. We are essentially a little township. So when we were part of an earthquake, although we did not have buildings that fell down, and we're fortunate to have no serious injuries on campus, we, in a microcosm of what the city experienced, had to deal with all that building stuff. I'm not going to talk about buildings anymore. The vision of the University of Canterbury has for many years been stated as tangata to tangata ora, people prepared to make a difference. And we've already heard much today about when the dust settles and the city rises, it is actually the people that count the most. Yes, we need capital. And yes, we certainly need a focus, a vision, and hope. But in the end, it's the people and the skills and those virtues that are embodied that will make this a great city, as it has been. But it is also the case that natural disasters have this rather unnasty habit of revealing underlying strengths and weaknesses and underlying trends. And therefore it is extremely wise not to forget one's history and to be open to the possibility that all was not perfectly formed and not even to try and recover that which was weak, to build on strengths but also to identify those trends. Earlier, we had a presentation which talked about the tailwinds of our times. And when you start thinking about a learning environment, you actually begin to think about three great tailwinds of our times that will shape this and the next generation, this city and our country. They are access and use of resources, for sure. In addition, without a doubt, the health and well-being of communities and individuals. And the third one is the creation and dissemination of knowledge. Now what a great place to be. The Vice-Chancellor of a university in a city that has suffered an enormous discontinuity and has created one of the greatest learning environments in the Western world. There are today over 170 research projects already running at the University of Canterbury or in the later stages of planning. Those projects have engaged many, if not all, of our 700 academic staff who are well-skilled and naturally curious about the world around them. We will, on the 5th of June, be holding a research seminar. 
More details will be forthcoming. And there there will be presentations on some of that research. But let me whet your appetite a little. You have heard some today about research going on and how this disruptive event has affected businesses and people. You'll all be familiar with the work that's been done in the geology areas about the state of the land, and what lies under it, how we measure it, how we model it, how public policy will be informed by it, how your insurance premiums will be affected by it, or whether you can ever get cover again. We've done research and continue to appear before commissions of inquiry to understand built structures and how they perform. We've engaged in new technologies and engineered timber, some of which has already been deployed on our campus, around the city, in New Zealand, and in other countries. New Zealanders are not always quick to promote themselves and not always quick to adopt things invented at home. Bice isolation technology was invented in New Zealand and is more extensively used in Japan. Interesting, huh? That the generation of knowledge, the critique of knowledge, the dissemination of knowledge once created and the protection of knowledge are the core of the business of a university. And this city is fortunate enough, thanks to the work that has gone on since 1873, to be host to one of the 250 best universities in the world. And one of the top 100 colleges of engineering and one of the top 100 hosts to disciplines in accounting, finance, economics, econometrics, and a number of other disciplines. Many cities would kill to have that kind of infrastructure when confronted with this kind of moment. But the university won't play its part in leadership because I, the vice chancellor, get up and tell our 700 academic staff what's on their work program tomorrow. It doesn't work that way. It never has and the institution is not designed as a professional consultancy. Our academic staff are responsible for the day job of teaching and research that informs that teaching. But you will see increasingly a wide range of participation in the community as we begin to gather an understanding and an evidence base to make the hard choices, and they will be hard, the hard choices that lie in front of us as we partly try and design, but also allow freedom of choice in what comes next. The University of Canterbury has suffered its own setbacks. I think of ourselves as having the three great capitals. Of course, the greatest of all is human capital. We only had 3.8% of our academic staff voluntarily resigned from the university in the 12 months to the end of February this year. Our average rate of voluntary resignations in our academic staff for the last decade has been 4% per annum. There is huge resilience and a desire to stay and contribute. But a learning environment requires not only the staff, but it does require the students. And here is another fact. Our postgraduate students, and we have over a thousand students at postgraduate level doing research degrees, our postgraduate student numbers have stayed the same and are up slightly. I say slightly because we're talking 10 or 20. On a thousand research postgraduate students and a thousand taught postgraduate students. All around the world, people have heard that this is an interesting place with exciting opportunities to learn. The city had a reputation as a learning environment before the earthquake. 17% of all New Zealand's education export earnings were generated in this city. Our natural share of the New Zealand economy is closer to 10 or 11%. It is the case that we for a long time as a community have put a high value on education. 